halfway through War and Peace and I have two weeks to finish it. Um, but I realised I've barely talked to you about what it's about or what's going on. So obviously War and Peace, War and Peace is about a war and the peace time in Russia. So the war is the Napoleonic Wars and we have many characters, more than 600 characters, but I think there are two families that are kind of, three families, there are three families that are kind of the most important and we normally see things from one of their pe people's perspectives um, and then there are some other floaters that kind of get involved with those two, three families. So we have the Rostovs, um, Mummy and Daddy Rostov, Daddy Rostov is not very good with money and they have four children, they have the older sister, whose name I can't remember, Vera, perhaps, Nikolai, Natasha, and Pyotr. And then they also have living with them Sonia, who is their cousin, and Boris, who is also their cousin. I don't know if Sonia and Boris are brother and sister. I can't remember. Um, so it's clearly not important. But Nikolai and Natasha are our two main people from that. So Nikolai, Natasha. Then we also have uh, the Bolokonskis. So we have Prince Andrei, who is married to Liza. We have his sister Maria, and we have his dad. And his dad is like cantankerous and really difficult to get on with. And Maria lives with him. She's very, very religious, under his thumb very much. And then Andre is a very big personality. He's married, he's very important in um, society. And so out of those people, Maria and Andre are our main characters. So we'll talk about them a bit. And then we also have Count Bazukov, and he has an illegitimate son, Pierre. And Count Bazukov dies at the very beginning and Pierre comes into a lot of money. Um, and Pierre is our other main character. Pierre gets married to Ellen Kuragin, and Kuragin has two sons as well. Ippolit is the um, one we don't really know about, but Anatol is the other important one, and Anatol gets involved with the Rostovs in a certain way. We also have um, Dolokhov, and Dolokhov wants to marry Sonia, but is turned down because she is in love with Nikolai. He uh, cheats. Nikolai out of a lot of money uh, and the class undertones of this book um, I don't think that Tolstoy is very much focused on class but there are times when I'm reading this and I'm like yeah maybe the Bolsheviks had a point um, particularly with Prince Andre uh, and some of the things he says to Pierre. That's very good but not for you I suppose you've never whipped anyone to death or sent them to Siberia and still less for the peasants if they're beaten whipped and sent to Siberia I don't think it makes it any worse for them in Siberia he'll go on with his brutish life, and the welts on his body will heal, and he'll be as happy as he was before. So those are kind of the main characters. There are other characters who are important as well, but these are the main ones. Um, and so I thought I should talk to you something about them and what I think of them. So we have Nikolai, like I said, the eldest son of the Rostovs. Nikolai was a curly-haired young man, not very tall, and with an open expression of the face. On his upper lip, a little back hair had already appeared, and his whole face expressed impetuousness and rapturousness. Nikolai blushed as soon as he came into the drawing room. One could see that he was searching for something to say and could not find it. And he is a very romantic guy. Not in terms of he's very much into romantic love, but that he has a big idea of his life and a big idea of, like, a romantic hero. This is set during the romantic movement, and I feel like Nikolai is our romantic character in that sense. He's very young, he's very naive, and he wants to go off to war because he, he romanticises war and being a hero and um, Russian masculinity of the time. He's the son of a wealthy family, and he doesn't really care about... The, the realities of that and the amount of money that they actually maybe have um, and so he goes off to war with this idea of it being like playing at soldiers um, and he also is in love with his cousin kind of in, a, in the idea of playing at being in love. There's a lot in the beginning in the Rostov family we're very much like inside family and there's a lot of this play and pretense of what life might be like at the beginning. They're all playing at life and then over the course of the novel they come to realise life in, in is different from how they have been playing at it particularly Nikolai and Natasha and so Nikolai goes off to war and there are many moments of him like in going after his friend Denisov who's been taken to um, hospital and him seeing the state of hospital him just being in the middle of a battle and he still gets into these romantic notions like he'll come up against the reality of the world and then he will still suddenly have to take a message to the emperor and be like this is the best thing ever I'm gonna be the hero all his wishes were being fulfilled that morning. General battle was to be given. He was to take part in it. Moreover, he was an orderly officer of the bravest of generals. Moreover, he was going with a message to Kutuzov, and maybe to the sovereign himself. 
The morning was bright, the horse under him was good. He felt joyful and happy. And his sister Natasha is very similar to him in that way. She's an incredibly naive person and is very much on the idea of the world. She's brought up with an idea of what a rich society, Russian woman, will be. And the Rostovs are kind of slightly outside of society. They are involved in it, but they live in the country and they stay in the country. People come to their house, um, but they're not always in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And in fact, going to Moscow and St. Petersburg is where Natasha comes into trouble. But as I was saying, she's this kind of naive girl and she's very much aware of herself as a pretty girl, as coming as coming from a wealthy family, as being desirable. She's constantly like watching herself and being aware of herself um, and getting pleasure from that. Ahead of the others, closer, a dark-haired girl came running towards the carriage. Very slender, strangely slender, dark-eyed in a yellow cotton dress, her head tied with a white kerchief from under which strands of loose hair escaped. The girl was shouting something, but, seeing the stranger, ran back laughing without looking at him. And she believes people when they say things to her, which is again how she ends up in trouble with some of the Russian fuckboys <laughs> that come up in this novel. A very passionate person, a very like impetuous person, because she has always been the queen of her own household. Her mum is not very strong and they have a very close relationship. And she like when she's bored and she can't think of anything to do, she goes about the house just ordering everyone to do things. No one in the house ordered so many people around or gave them so much work as Natasha. She could not look at people indifferently, without sending them somewhere. It seemed as if she were testing whether any of them would get angry or upset with her, but people liked carrying out Natasha's orders, as they did no one else's. What shall I do? Where shall I go? thought Natasha, walking slowly down the corridor. She's not just ordering about servants, she's ordering about her siblings, her parents, like, she's very much always been in control and in charge, and no one's ever said no to her. And so she comes up against that as well, against what, how the real world would treat her. And so. We see glimpses of this earlier when Andre's wife also dies in childbirth because she's been the little princess the whole time they've called her the little princess. Her tone was querulous now. Her little lip rose, giving her face not a joyful but an animalish, squirrel-like expression. She fell silent, as if finding it indecent to speak of her pregnancy in front of Pierre, though that was where the essence of the matter lay. Again, not fully aware of the world. And I feel like a lot of this book is people coming into confrontation with what the world is really like. And these people are good hearted, but innocents in a way. This book is about the ways that both the world of war and the world of peace can rip people apart. And it does with Liza. And that has such an effect on Andre. So Andre at the beginning is very detached from his wife um, and he is detached from the world in which he's living. Seems to have already gone through this disillusionment and it happens to him again and again. This new person was the young Prince Andre Bolokoski, the little princess's husband. Prince Bolokoski was of medium height, a rather handsome young man with well-defined and dry features. Everything in his figure, from his weary, bored gaze to his quiet, measured gait, presented the sharpest contrast with his small, lively wife. Obviously, he not only knew everyone in the drawing room, but was also so sick of them that it was very boring for him to look at them and listen to them. He will come, become involved with war and then be disillusioned with the way that the war is going. He'll become involved with women and then be disillusioned with that woman. He keeps running into the real world and he seems to not be able to find a comfortable place. He's older than Natasha and Nikolai by quite a long way. and. So he, he is more aware and more like sure of himself. And he's a very grumpy person. He has this whole thing about he's going out into the woods during springtime and everything's spring and fresh. And he talks about this old oak tree that's wizened and gnarled. And that's where his focus is on. And we kind of see something about him there that he is, feels himself to be older than the world and also feels like the world has harmed him. It's very moving the moment when his wife dies. At the side of the road stood an oak probably ten times older than the birches of the woods. It was ten times as thick and twice as tall as any birch. It was an enormous oak, twice the span of a man's arm's girth, with some limbs broken off long ago, and broken bark covered with old scars. With its huge, gnarled, ungainly, unsymmetrically spread arms and fingers, it stood, old, angry, scornful and ugly, amidst the spiling birches. I feel like the Rostov world is this pretty glittering light childlike world and the um, Bolokonsky world is a much darker place. So like I said earlier, the father is also this old wizened grumpy guy and the way that he takes that out on his daughter is incredible. She is such a piteous character and I feel like she does live in a world of self-pity as well. Princess Maria went back to her room with the sad frightened expression which rarely left her and made her unattractive sickly face more unattractive.
and sat down at her desk, covered with miniature portraits and heaped with books and notebooks. The princess was as disorderly as her father was orderly. He takes everything out on her and makes everything her fault and it can be hard to read from her perspective because she takes everything out on herself as well. She would weep in quiet and feel she was a sinful woman. She very much blames herself for everything that happens. And again, there's still a tinge of uh, class warfare going on because she has a companion who is a French maid, I guess. She's a French lady's maid, like she's a, a well-to-do well woman but not in the same class as them. And her feelings about that woman, um, especially her, that woman's relationship with her father, gets very classist very quickly. Um, so I can see, yeah, these, these two particularly feel quite ready for the guillotine sometimes. I, I mean that they are very much like insular in their own world but in a different way. They are stuck in their class. And then we have Pierre who is Count Buzikov. He is the illegitimate son of a very rich man and when that very rich man dies at the very beginning of the book he becomes a very rich man. Despite this greeting of the lowest sort, at the sight of the entering Pierre, uneasiness and fear showed in Anna Pavlovna's face. Like that expressed at the sight of something all too enormous and unsuited to the place. Though Pierre was indeed somewhat larger than the other men in the room, this fear could have referred only to the intelligent and at the same time shy, observant and natural gaze which distinguished him from everyone else in the drawing room. But he is again not, not really been in society and so people trying to take him under their wing but what they mean really is take advantage of him. He's another person looking for his place in the world and he's constantly giving out money and being tricked out of his money um, because he's just so kind-hearted but also foolish. He's very very stupid. He's constantly trying to find the thing that will ground him. He feels like a very like loose character, a character who's uncertain of anything and he's just trying to find some certainty. So he becomes a Freemason at one point trying to find a way for the world. He tries to change things things in his um, land with um, the serfs and things he wants to like emancipate them but he, because he doesn't really know anything he is easily tricked out of his plans um, and things just keep going the way they always have done. He has no follow through, he is kind of a very like ephemeral person, he he's, has all these thoughts and ideas and he's very introverted but he doesn't, introspective, but he doesn't really know how to be in the world. And then alongside these five we have some other characters, um, like I mentioned Denisov earlier who is like just a friendly soldier man. Uh, we have Boris who is the cousin of Natasha and Nikolai, the opposite of Natasha and Nikolai where they are, he's not as rich as them, uh, and where they are very idealistic and romantic and uh, naive. He is very like clear-minded and knows what he wants, knows how what he needs to get and is very uh, going out of his way to manipulate the world around him to get what he needs. Um, I quite admire him for that compared to all these other characters. He's like, no, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go and do that. And then we have Karagin, Anatol Karagin, who is the fuck boy of the book. Um, he knows he is handsome, he knows he is charming, and again he is out for what he wants. But while Boris is manipulating people, he's manipulating people within the strictures of society. He never does anything mm, he never does anything wrong by the morals of the society, whereas Karagin doesn't care about the world. So those are my thoughts that I've been having about the characters so far, um, and I have really been enjoying it, really getting into this book. Whilst I think there are some elements of uh, Tolstoy's characterizations, uh, particularly women that aren't the, per the best, women are weeping all over the place in this book. Women just burst into tears all the time. I do think that these are quite layered and complex characters, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do for the next 600 pages of the book. I am currently in Peru. Um, the vlogs of that will probably already have gone up or already have at least started to go up by the time this video goes live so I'll leave that in the cards above. Um, so I am reading War and Peace but I didn't bring the big chunky book version of it because um, that's a lot to carry when you are traveling around Peru for three weeks. So I've got it on my Kindle as well. Same translation, I'm reading the Piva and Volokontiki translation um, and I am my book says 4% of the way into it now, um, but that does include the introduction, which was actually really good because it was more like a translator's introduction than um, an introduction that like spoils the plot, like a lot of the introductions of classics do. Um, but this one was quite good um, in that it didn't do that and it just talked about translation and Tolstoy's writing of the book. Um, and yeah, that was interesting. And I am actually finding the book, I'm still at the party that it begins with, um, but I'm finding it a lot more readable than I thought I would. It's quite humorous, um, which I wasn't expecting. Hello, so, oh gosh, I'm in 
Arequipa, uh, which is the second biggest city in Peru. And it is quite a lot wetter than Lima. And there are some spots on this camera. I am now 10% of the way into the piece. Uh, so I thought I would tell you about it. Um, I'm enjoying it so far. Uh, the French isn't as distracting as I thought it was. And because I'm reading it on Kindle, the footnotes are just, you can just tap on them and they show you the translation. It's really loud here. So hopefully you can hear me. So far we are visiting various different places, different parties, um, kind of getting to know our vast group of characters um, and getting to know the sort of social position of Russia in the, the early 19th century. It's around the Napoleonic Wars, so the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, and um, some of them are going off to war at the moment. And yeah, we're just seeing the machinations regarding money. The only thing is that you read half an hour and you've read like 1% of the book, um, so that's a little off-putting, but it's pretty good. Hello, so I am now 40% of the way through War and Peace and I thought I should update you as to my thoughts on the book so far. Um, I'm still enjoying it, I'm just finding myself less inclined to want to read it. Um, I enjoy it whilst I'm reading it but I think it's just such an intimidating book still because I'm only 40% of the way through even though I feel like I've been reading it for ages. But yeah, I still find it very compelling. I, was, I did a live reading sprints with Charlotte um, and Milena who did the live show with me who are the co-hosts for this uh, for this book for the book club and we discussed some of the things about it. Melania was talking about the underdeveloped female characters. Um, it is interesting how often women just burst into tears. <laughs> there is a lot of weeping women but I, I still think that, the, that at least two of the women are quite compelling and there aren't that many more <laughs> compelling male characters. I also am still not enamoured of the war uh, parts of things. I, I don't mind when we're looking at the interactions between people or there was a moment where Rostov went to a war hospital and saw the effect of typhus on the soldiers and I found that really fascinating actually to read about. I saw someone say that uh, Tolstoy is like Jane Austen if the war were included because they're both set at the same time period. I'm re still really enjoying the way that he shows society, I think that that's uh, very well done, there's a, there's a lot of humour, um, it's quite a funny book, there are lots of things that I've highlighted as well and we've recently, a cha the chapter that I've just started listening to talks about going on a hunt on an early winter morning and just the description of this winter morning when now Rostov is back in peaceful times. It's just the, the, the sort of physicality of the things he's describing, the sense, sensuousness of it. It's really wonderful, really lovely. Here, however, is some sort of magical forest with flowing dark shadows and the sparkle of diamonds and with flights of some sort of marble steps and some sort of animals. And this is indeed Melyukovka, then it's all the more strange that we drove God knows where and arrived at Melyukovka, thought Nikolai. Um, and the translation does a really good job of making it feel really lovely as well. Hello, so I am now 75% of the way through War and Peace. We are in the last volume, um, although there are there is the two epilogues as well to get through. I'm still feeling very similarly about it. I still... I feel more for Pierre than I did before. I thought he was just kind of a bumbling fool. Um, and he still is. Like, his naivety is really difficult to get on board with because it feels so ridiculous. But I understand it to a certain extent um, because he grew up kind of isolated because of his status as a, an illegitimate child. But you would think that that, the cruelty, growing up with the cruelty in the world because of that, he would be aware that people can take advantage of you. And he seems to just blunder into battles and difficult situations because he doesn't think anything through. And it's kind of annoying <laughs> to follow a character like that. But I think that him and Andre, why both of them love Natasha, is because Natasha comes from the Rostovs. And the Rostovs, whilst their father is useless with money, um, both Pierre and Andre come from money. They have money. Money is not something they are worried about. What they don't have is family. So I finally finished The Beast that is War and Peace by Lev Tolstoy. Um, oh, that's good. And I've talked about it with Milena and Charlotte, um, so I'll leave that live show linked in the cards above if you want to go check it out. But my overall thoughts is 
So towards the end I was, to be perfectly honest, skimming through the parts of the book that were Tolstoy's theorising on why Napoleon had lost the war in Russia. And it's not relevant to our characters, it's historical non-fiction that I don't read, military history that I don't read, like I'm not interested in it. <laughs> I don't want it from a novel. Um, and I know that it's a thing that happens in historical novels like um, in Les Mis, all of the uh, diversions about the sewage system and the Napoleonic Wars and stuff. So it's not super uncommon and also this was published in um, Serially so he's like padding it out <laughs> with the other stuff he's thinking about I guess. Um, but yeah it didn't really work for me. Um, but apart from that up until the epilogue I kind of enjoyed I really in, kind of enjoyed reading the actual experience. I thought that the characters were all very interesting. I enjoyed their relationships with one another. I definitely thought they were all having relationships with ideas of one another and it's a lot about like dreams and illusions and shattering of illusions and things like that are very common in the book. Andre had an idea about marriage and then he got married and then his idea was shattered so then he went to war and then his idea of war got shattered and then he came back and fell in love with this very young girl who was from a family that he had never had a family like that and then she gets swept up in an illusion of love and lust and sexuality that she's never really been exposed to because of her sheltered upbringing anyway so she, her interests about the world get shattered and his idea of her gets shattered and that causes them to fall apart and leads to his eventual death. Um, so there's a lot about shattering of illusions that I thought was quite interesting and how no one truly really understands other people um, despite a constant search for truth and I found all of that like really compellingly readable. But I would say that the epilogues, both of them, were just the things that I disliked about this book condensed and I found that quite frustrating. So the epilogue, one of the epilogues was just a rehash of everything about war and about how Napoleon lost the war and about our ideas of history and great men of history which can be an interesting thing and was interesting the first two times it came up um, but when it came up over and over and over again and then there was a whole epilogue de devoted to it I was just like this is really boring Tolstoy, you don't need to say the same thing 1200 times through your 1200 page novel. Um, and then the other epilogue had married Natasha whose life was entirely devoted to her husband, how all of her outbursts had been, all of her outbursts in her pre-married life had been because of her desperate need for children and a husband um, and now that she had loads of children that was way better and she was much more calm and happy. And it's fine that some people enjoy being a wife and mother, I wouldn't have even been upset with it if it hadn't been, if it had just been she enjoys being a wife and mother because she's always come from a big family where family is super important and um, so having a family that starting her own family is really great for her. Fine. But she gives up music. She gives up music because it was only ever about seducing men and it always felt like she loved music and she was this kind of free wild character who was um, had passions and loves and music was a way of expressing that and it came from not just inside her but kind of outside of her it felt bigger than her and then she just gives it up when she gets married because she's no longer trying to attract a suitor and it seemed like more like men were attracted to her singing because it represented something about her character her freedom and now that she's trapped she's lost her music and yeah it just felt kind of sad and when we were talking in the live show we were talking about how you can read more into the female characters and their place in life than Tolstoy necessarily seems to understand about them um, because it feels like she's depressed at the end of this book. She's so erratic and so unhappy when Pierre isn't there and she reads to me like she feels trapped and she feels like that loss of freedom and um, maybe Tolstoy didn't quite understand that because she is supposed to be based on his own wife. Um, so yeah the sexism <laughs> I mean what can you expect really from a 19th century male novelist but there is a certain amount of sexism that I can overlook in a Victorian novel because the ideas of the time are not the same, we can't judge people by the standards of today when they weren't around today um, but I don't know, I just found why did she have to give up music, why did she have to give up any idea of herself outside of her children, like that's not how people are. <laughs> there are several books where if you leave out the epilogue it becomes a much better book and I think that that is definitely true of War and Peace. I'm glad I finally read it, I'm glad um, that Milena and Charlotte chose it for this book club and that we all managed to make our way through it and it was definitely an experience <laughs> um, so I'm glad it's done. It does, Charlotte said that rereading Lamer's things became less, like the tangents become less 
um, annoying and boring because you know kind of how finite they are and so that makes me intrigued to reread it but I also want to reread Anna Karenina and Vanity Fair and like a lot of these chunky books feel like they would really bear rereading and I just don't know if I have the bandwidth and the wish to invest a huge amount of time again in such a big book um, because I barely ever reread books even when they're my favourite so I don't know maybe I will maybe I won't but I hope you have enjoyed this experience and I hope this video has been interesting for you do please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe I've been out new videos twice a week so I will see you again very soon and thank you for watching bye bye